Okay, everybody, thank you. Sorry for the technical glitch. It wouldn't be Zoom, a real Zoom without some technical glitches. Um, I'm Susan Henderson from Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund. Thank you for joining us this afternoon for our update from the disability and older adult community representative members of the California Vaccine Advisory Committee. So I wanna welcome Christina Mills, Sylvia Yi, Andy Imperato, Denny Chan, and Aaron Carruthers, who have been meeting for months and keeping on top of what's going on and making sure that the, the CVAC committee is keeping older adults and disabled people in mind. Um, so, and our uh, moderator today will be Sylvia Yi from DREDF. Okay, next slide. I just wanted to let everybody know that we have interpretation from English to Spanish. You can join by using the um, interpretation icon at the bottom of the screen. Um, you click on it and then select the language Spanish for this um, presentation. Next. For um, there's closed captioning, make sure to click on the CC button at the bottom of the screen and captions will appear. We have two ASL interpreters today, Tammy and Brandon. So make sure you're in gallery view, which is up in the, there's a view um, icon at the upper right. Click on the interpreter's videos. They say ASL interpreter Brandon, ASL interpreter Tammy, and the three dots in the corner of the video screen and say pin video. When the slides are showing, you can use the vertical bar on the right to make the slides smaller and the interpreter's videos will increase in size. And since we don't really have a slideshow today, we'll just keep all the presenters and the interpreters on the screen. Next. Um, please keep your mics muted and your videos off so we do see the interpreters um, all the time. Thanks, we appreciate that. Next. And finally, at the end of the presentation by the members of the CVAC committee, we'll answer questions. And um, I guess we're ready to go. So Sylvia, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Stop chair. Stop chair. Um, so today we just wanted to, to look back at some of, the, some of what's worked, what needs improvement and future challenges in the area of vaccination in California. Um, the, the five of us on the panel today are five who have worked on the California committee. Uh, com <laughs> I forgot what CVAC stands for. The, <laughs> the Community Vaccine Advisory Committee in California. And we've um, had the challenge of working quickly while staying on top of some very fast breaking scientific articles, political announcements, news of problems on the ground and engaging with multiple equity concerns. Um, so uh, the five of us worked together on calling out the needs of people with disabilities, including home and community-based services recipients, while also acknowledging the continuing needs of those in congregate living, as well as the equity, equity needs of frontline workers, prisoners, homeless populations, racial and ethnic groups, low-income groups, LGBTQ groups, um, the CVAC was a challenging environment to work in. And today, just I wanted to open with, um, you know, giving kudos to all of my fellow panelists for working so closely together and recognizing our common interests. Together, we wanted to ensure that vaccination priorities recognize people with high-risk conditions and disabilities. We found increasing common interests as we went along, such as, such as emphasizing the need to reach individuals who could not leave their homes for vaccination and pushing for more specific data on vaccination of older persons and people with disabilities, including intersectional race and ethnicity data. By the time we reached mid-January, the CVAC had been meeting for almost two months, and we've been pushing very hard, the five of us collectively in public and behind the scenes for including people with high risk conditions as a priority vaccine population. We've been gathering and developing evidence that showed why the prioritization was necessary and why people with disabilities were at high risk. Our group in, in January made it clear that we would not just keep doing what we're doing and showing up at CVAC meetings if the state did not have a clear plan to include persons with disabilities at high risk. When California finally acknowledged that people with disabilities, high risk individuals would be vaccinated beginning March 15th, 
it was a victory for the community and the state's acceptance that people with disabilities could self attest as to their high risk was a further victory. Getting the state to prioritize care providers even before that, we also consider that a victory. And that isn't to say that everything went smoothly. I mean, we know that individuals faced inaccessible websites, inaccessible procedures and inaccessible vaccination sites. We know that some care providers were turned away. We continue to work on issues such as vaccinating people who cannot leave their homes, but it was important to stand together and insist on an explicit recognition for people with disabilities with high-risk conditions. And so I'm now gonna ask my fellow panelists to share their experiences, their impressions, and their current priorities um, in California's vaccine efforts. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Aaron to start with, uh, to look uh, to talk a little bit, um, and Aaron is an executive director of the California State Council on Developmental Disabilities. And I'm going to ask him to speak a little bit about how it was to maintain relationships with key administration contacts. Um, he was very good at that. Uh, fostering communication and working for a broad alliance of the disability community um, that included but not, did not end with those who had individual and developmental disabilities, even though some of the initial research focused specifically on those segments of the population. And I also um, commend Aaron for being someone who's very good with being persistent about unanswered questions. Aaron? Thank you, Sylvia. It's it's. Uh, this group has just become one of my favorite groups to be with, so I have to laugh when you say regarding persistent of unanswered questions because uh, when their questions are weren't answered, I just stay on it and stick with it and to, uh, often to the, the very apparent annoyance um, of the people we were trying to get answers from. So uh, uh, Danny was very good about that too. So um, uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Sylvia. So you asked me to talk about how we maintain relationships with department officials and administration, how that worked in our strategy um, uh, for, for um, advancing the priorities for people with uh, disabilities. And part of that just starts with the structure of the state council. The state council on developmental disabilities is a state department. Um, but we are independent. Our statute that creates us says you're independent. Um, you can go advocate and, and do other things. And we administratively aren't under any other department or agency. We report directly to organizationally to the governor's office. Um, and that allows us kind of a, a one foot in each realm. We are a state department. I am a director of a state department, but we have this, this charge to be advocates. Um, so it's a, it's a it's a pretty privileged mission. It, it really is, and I'm I'm honored uh, for what we have. And when these moments come up, um, where we need the state to really hear and understand the, the needs of people with disabilities, uh, that we're able I'm able to lean into that unique role um, uh, to to be able to have the connections with the state departments. Um, looking back at some of what happened uh, really well is that um, we were able to get the State Departments to do three things, because um, there were opportunities here for, for them that aren't natural to other State Departments. Um, part of that was to think beyond their program, think broader. You know, Department of Developmental Services issues, they, they release, they have a program they deliver. It's through the regional centers. Department of um, uh, Social Services has many programs they deliver, as we're thinking about it, it's through IHSS. Um, and so when they come to an issue, they they're typically want to come to it with that lens. How are we um, meeting the needs of the people in our services? But the reality is they need to start thinking across enterprises um, that people aren't just an individual who is in a program, but they, they are multifaceted and often in multiple programs, um, like about 20% of people who are regional center uh, consumers are also in IHSS. Uh, the next thing we were able to get them to do was so the, the first was to think across the enterprise, the enterprise being state operations. The next we were able to get them to do, um, and, and they were pretty willing to do this, was, was be proactive. Um, so think beyond your program and then be proactive. Uh, there was a lot of really interesting uh, uh, forward thinking actions that started coming out of the Department of Developmental Services um, as they were uh, thinking about how do we just respond, how do we get, uh, 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 not react to what's happening, but try to get ahead of what's reacting. And that led to the third piece, uh, the opportunity, which was uh, to be creative. So state departments 
thinking beyond their program, being proactive and being creative. And part of that creativity is still existing today as, as the departments are thinking about how do we get uh, vaccines to people who are truly homebound? How do we get to vaccines to people who um, uh, access is a barrier? Um, how do we get vaccines to people who, uh, who um, are still resistant? Um, I think that's the next frontier. You know, any town hall that I've been in or conversations I've been in, um, wherever I am in the state, whatever language is being spoken, I'll ask, you know, who, who's interested in getting the vaccine or who already got it? And it's about 25, uh, uh, 75, 80% of people like, I'm on it. Um, I want it. So the system right now is thinking about how do we get the vaccine quickly, efficiently, safely to the people who want it. Um, I know that the conversations among the people here are thinking ahead of the future of how do we work with and get information that people who, who aren't yet rushing to get it because uh, there's still more information that they need. Um, I really want to praise this group because um, it allows us as disability advocates to think as we're asking the state to think beyond uh, their specific program, it also allows us to think beyond, beyond specifically who we serve. And the State Council on Developmental Disabilities is very specific. We're developmental disabilities. The science coming out was very specific. It's impacting people with intellectual and developmental disabilities um, in, in, in first ways that we, we can see. But the leadership of the State Council refused to narrow its advocacy to just people with intellectual and development disabilities and said, we know in our hearts and in our homes that this illness, this virus impacts more than just people with intellectual and development disabilities. And we will stay continuing to advocate beyond us. Um, I, could, I don't know if you could tell that a timer went off, but I was given five minutes and the bell just went off. So um, uh, thank you, Sylvia. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, I appreciate your conscientiousness on the timing. And I'm gonna open it up to any of the other panelists who if they have a, a question that they want to ask you, um, let's have a little interaction here. So this is Andy. I'm I'm wondering, Aaron. You know, you're pretty connected to the developmental disability councils across the country. Do you feel like this kind of cross disability collaboration around vaccine prioritization um, was happening in other states, or do you feel like California was kind of unusual in that regard? I think we had the opportunity to, to be unusual. Um, and what I mean by that is other states were really still focused on fighting on the fundamentals. Um, so other DD councils were fighting just to get um, who we had as tier one accepted in their states as tier one. So, you know, there are states where the politics is, is vaccine resistance. Um, so how do you get it to people who are, were on the CDC list? How do you get it to people who are in congregate settings? How do you get it to um, healthcare providers? Um, so a, a lot of what I heard from other states was is them really fighting for just the step one. Aaron, this is Christina from CFILC. I agreed with a lot of your comments and have really enjoyed working with this team. Um, it feels like for longer than we've been together, but for years now and really appreciated it. Um, you're right, the state council holds a very unique position in so many different ways. And I'm just curious to know um, for, for folks out in the community that are watching and listening, do you feel like um, because of your unique situation and being a state department that there are sometimes things that you get to influence that are better done internally than externally? And are there ways that community members can help influence state departments like yours and the State Independent Living Council to make sure that when you have that platform that you're using it for the voice of the community? Yeah, what a great, that's a, a great insightful question. It's, um, you know, advocacy, if we get really, um, uh, if I can oversimplify, um, advocacy can be seen as we're often as advocates we're on the outside pushing in. There's something inside an institution, a department, a policy, and we're on the outside of it, pushing it, trying to change it. Um, I, when I, I communicate to our council members as you're actually insiders pushing in, um, and what's ne both are needed. Both are needed to, to for change. Um, and the Independent Living Centers and the State Independent Living Councils, well, in, not the State Independent Living Council, but the Independent Living Centers is a really good example of how both need to happen. There are things that, that you can do and certainly that DRC and DREDF can do uh, that we can't do. We can't 
as a State Department say call to action. Everybody do this now. Um, but we certainly can reach out to the governor's office and say, you know, there's 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 really some agitation and, and uh, there's about to be a big backlash. And you can get ahead of this if you want, um, but uh, you know, you're you're informed. Um, so so we need each other. Um, and uh, it, it's actually a neat um, development in watching leaderships as they come in as council members, watching their leadership uh, change um, from that that outsider pushing into that more insider. Uh, I guess it's a matter of diplomacy. Thank you, both Andy and Christina, for the questions. And I'm, I'm given time, I'm going to push ahead and ask Denny. Uh, Denny Chan to, to speak next. Uh, Denny is uh, the new Directing Attorney for Equity Advocacy, which is a whole new initiative at Justice and Aging. Uh, he has been a strong ally to the disability community, even when the age-based framework announced in California appeared to ensure priority vaccination of older persons. Denny has insisted that an age-based framework must still be accountable for achieving racial and ethnic equity vaccine goals and data. Um, and he's been working a lot on the current state of meeting the transportation needs and house call vaccinations for both people with disabilities and older, older persons. Denny? Hi everyone, thank you Sylvia for a very kind introduction. Um, thank you for all the work in assembling today's town hall and a big shout out to all my fellow panelists. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure working with you all. Um, so I thought I'd give you a little bit of background. You know, I feel like in some ways I'm the odd person out here because I'm specifically um, representing or do advocacy on behalf of older adults. Um, Justice and Aging is a national legal advocacy organization um, with a kind of heavy California bent. Two out of our three offices are in California. And um, our mission is to fight senior poverty and specifically focus on the programs that keep older adults happy and at home. Um, and so I am the new director of equity advocacy at this organization, um, but in my previous role and uh, when the CVAC first started, I was a healthcare team attorney and had been for about seven years. Um, you know, I think what's really important and what I want to underscore in my comments today is that um, it was really important from our perspective and specifically from my perspective to be as vocal and as ardent of an advocate and a ally to the disability community. Um, for a number of reasons. One, obviously, because a lot of our issues overlap, and indeed, many older adults face the same issues as people with disabilities. And also, if we think and use an intersectionality framework, a number of the older adults that I'm fighting for every day also are people with disabilities. So, you know, even if the state decided, as they initially did, to prioritize older adults in the rollout, um, we knew that the system would still remain broken. Um, and that even if you prioritize older adults in the front end, that if they can't get through the hotline or if they can't get through online, those are likely gonna be many of the same barriers or if they have to have the vaccine at home, those are likely gonna be the same barriers that people with disabilities will also experience um, in terms of actually being able to get the shot in, in people's arms. And I'll also point out that, you know, um, our organization working with our friends here today you know, isn't just new to the CVAC. Um, our partnerships and collaboration come after a long and pretty rich history of being partners more generally, and also specifically working on COVID-19 issues. Um, a number of us were working together when the state earlier during the pandemic released discriminatory um, care rationing guidance. Um, so this really was kind of a natural evolution in our partnership um, that um, I'm really happy I could work with everyone on. When the state first announced um, and sort of started signaling that they were going to lean toward a very age and occupation heavy approach and allocation, um, I remember that meeting specifically because I think it was the meeting right before Christmas. <laughs> and I remember a number of us were chatting each other in the private chat um, in Zoom saying, we need to do something about this because it looks like the state's really gonna leave a lot of important people out. We spent a lot of time in those CBAC meetings talking about how allocation should be given out, what equity really means, um, and the state you know, always coming up with a concern around administrability, um, what's gonna be the easiest for them to do and, and preventing fraud and other really awful things that happen. Um, 
So I remember specifically, I think it was after that CBAC meeting, a number of us hopped on a call afterward. And in like the most, the fastest turnaround time ever, we're able to get a letter to the CBAC chairs asking that they prioritize specifically home and community-based services um, recipients in this allocation framework. Um, and so that I feel like was the, the sort of critical start um, in the evolution of CBAC and, and me thinking about how to best partner with you all on um, advocating for the concerns of both of our communities. I'll also say, you know, as much as an age-based framework is not completed, also it is not complete because it doesn't recognize intersectionality in a lot of different ways. Um, and a number of us at CBAC meetings were raising those concerns around disability and race. And one thing that I've been trying to get the state to do a better job of in CVAC meetings is releasing data. Um, the data that's currently released on the CDPH website is really uh, quite limited. Um, they have a large focus. Their interpretation of equity often is using the Healthy Places Index, and that is an important measure, but it certainly is not exclusive um, in many and in, 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 um, adequate by itself. And so, you know, if you look at the demographic data, there's very little information about, about people with disabilities. And then even for the information that they're reporting on, um, they're also, they're usually just reporting on age or on gender. Um, and it's not looking at a cross section, um, but other states have been doing that, right? So we know, for example, in Washington, we know, for example, I think it's in South Carolina, um, they can give you a very granular um, reporting out of among older adults of color, you know, what do the vaccination rates look like? And the frustrating part for me is that, um, you know, counties in California are also reporting these. So for example, we know in Orange County that um, vaccination rates among older Latinos lag about 10% behind older white adults. Um, so for whatever reason though, that's not making its way up to the state in a way that the, way, in a way that the state is reporting on that in a timely manner. So um, we still have a lot of work to do in that front. I do think there's, you know, in addition to um, the big March 15th deadline that Sylvia referenced before, there is a lot of other ways in which we've come together, right? Specifically around in-home vaccinations and transportation. Um, the state, the last time we heard, was finalizing a transportation contractor and working with local health departments um, to offer in-home vaccinations. There will be, you know, there's always one thing to have the plan and it's another thing to implement the plan. So as we move closer to implementation, um, there will be a number of issues um, as we as we kind of work through the prog work through the, the, the process. And then the last thing I'd say is, um, you know, the issues that COVID-19 has raised are not time limited in nature. Um, and certainly, even though people will be vaccinated, and we we're just talking before about how it is likely people will need a booster, right? So there will we'll have to be doing some of this all over again. Um, but also the larger questions around equity and how broken all of our systems are, how starved our public health infrastructure is, how uncoordinated and siloed everything is. All those will remain challenges regardless of whether how many people get the vaccine or don't. And so I very much think that in the future, all of our communities, aging, disability, and others have many opportunities to continue to work together. And then the last thing I would flag before I suspect I shortly will run out of time is that um, Justice in Aging did last month launch a new initiative focusing on advancing equity in our programmatic and advocacy. Um, and that has a specific focus on, uh, a primary focus on race equity, um, but also intersectionality. Um, and so I think, you know, given how broken all of our systems are and how COVID exposed a lot of those brokenness, a lot of that brokenness, um, and the new initiative that I'll be leading at Justice in Aging, I think there will be many opportunities to continue to build on the strong partnerships that we form in doing all this COVID-19 work. Um, so with that, I'll turn it back to Sylvia. Thank you, Denny. I appreciate your words. And um, I'm just going to open it up to the other panelists again to if they have a, a question or two to ask. Um, and then, yes, I'll just, I'll leave it there and then I'll go on to the. So this is Andy. Um, Denny, you know, you're kind of like DREDF in the sense that you're a national organization that also has a big presence in California. Um, I'm wondering, you know, wearing your national hat, do you think the collaboration that's going on in California between advocates for older adults 
and the disability community is happening in the same way at the national level or in other states, or do you see California as kind of an outlier in that regard? I would say there are pockets of collaboration outside of California between disability and aging advocacy organizations. I know a number of my DC colleagues are um, working with a number of federal uh, disability advocates. Um, but in terms of that really close collaboration that we have on a local level, you know, I think that's much rarer. And it's actually a model that I think is important for all of us to be thinking about um, in other states and looking for opportunities to build out. Um, because I do think it, it is not always a, um, a common kind of collaboration and coalition building, despite all the similarities and, and uh, many of the same issues that we're all fighting. Um, but it's much rarer to see that in-depth kind of work um, and some of that I think is changing on a federal level, but it'll take some time to trickle down to the states. And I will also say just, to, just that I think that's what made our advocacy more effective, honestly, um, is for sometimes for me at CBAC meetings to say, you know, plus one um, to everything that Sylvia said, or plus one to everything that Christina said, um, because I'm not, you know, viewed as someone who's just advocating on behalf of the disability community. This is Christina. Andy stole my question, um, but I'm going to advance on it a little bit. And because of that close knit, uh, very bonded work that we've been doing collectively in California, I know best practice and is a model for the rest of the country. Um, but still, there's some there's some hesitancy between disability and aging organizations to come together and do this work that is very much intersectional. And I'm just wondering, because to me, this goes well beyond vaccines. This is you know, our future and working together on so many different levels and ways. But um, especially in your new position, Denny, I'm just wondering any, any thoughts on how we can push to continue to work together and sort of forge that for the rest of the country to see as a benefit for our community members? I think, um, you know, I, I'm a big believer in data, <laughs> if that's not clear um, from all the work on the CVAC. I think one of the things that I'd like to continue to push California on, because um, I remember early on in, in, our, um, in our prioritization days when we're thinking about who to prioritize, the state said, well, you know, show us the data. And I remember us sort of very uniformly saying, like, Part of the reason why we don't have, I mean, we have some data and we showed you that data, but part of the reason why we don't have the data you want is because of discrimination, right? Because of the ways in which these populations and these communities are rendered invisible. Um, so I think that's a huge, and, and because of COVID-19, I think we've seen how broken the data systems are, um, how little is collected, how little is made sort of tr uh, transferred to different entities, so that I think is an area that's gonna be because health equity and disparities are kind of the new buzzword. I think that's an area where in the next three to five years, we can make a significant sort of effort to improve data collection, data systems, so that you know hopefully the next time we're in any sort of kind of a similar situation, the structures will be in place that we can say, here's the data you want, right? To prioritize and to be able to make those decisions. Thank you, yeah, I think, um... It's definitely been a wake up call for, for me and for CFILC and uh, disability data is far and few in between. And I've certainly gained a lot from what the aging community has done in their data collection efforts. So I appreciate that greatly. Um, but I think that we, we as advocates can do a better job at making sure that we ourselves, our organizations and our community members are voicing that data question and concern at all levels. And I know this is you know, going a little off, but we have an opportunity in Cal AIM right now to change what the dashboard looks like in the future. And I think we should think really collectively on what kind of data we can actually gain from that as a disability community. It's right in front of us and we can't let that go. Sylvia, is there time for another question? Um, so you haven't asked one yet, Aaron, so I'm going to say yes. Well, you know how I watch the clock, so if there's not time, I, I can forego <laughs> it. Um, uh, Denny, you um, 
the way you held the line was not easy because other uh, senior groups were seeing that the state was moving in their direction and want to protect that. And there were moments when each group got a little bit into, they had flashes of tribalism. I got mine, and if you get yours, that means I'm losing mine. Um, what strategies would you recommend for those moments um, of, of continuing to maintain the broadness of the advocacy, even as others are, are pulling back? Um, that's a really good question, I feel like the the vaccine rollout um, so easily force people into their corners um, because this issue of scarcity was so real, right? I mean, I remember in those early CVAC meetings, we get the updates and it was like this fraction of vaccines are coming to the state and we're getting even less next week because of X, Y, and Z reason. Um, and in that context, it's so easy for people to just say, well, I'm okay with my group, let's keep moving forward. I think, you know, one of the strategies that I think we tried using, and I'm not sure if it was all that successful, but I'd like to think it was, a, it was effective, is really showing the overlap in these different communities um, to say that, you know, when you're prioritizing X, you're also prioritizing Y. Um, and then also to really point out sometimes some of the ridiculousness of state policy. Um, I remember one of the, the challenges to the home, the at home vaccinations early on was this notion that if you, um, because of a strict adherence to an age-based formula, that you would go in and vaccinate the older adult who was eligible. But then the home health agency said, when I'm already there, I wanna do everyone else, right? And state policy is not letting me do that. And I think that's a pretty, I mean, at the end of the day, all of us had a vested public health interest in getting as many people vaccinated as possible. Um, and so to, in areas which we could point out that doesn't make a ton of sense, you are not serving the older adult in that population because that's an actual barrier. And then you're also not serving the people who the, the larger public health goal. Um, so, you know, I think, but it is really tough because that number, that really concrete number of set aside vaccines is limited. Um, and it was also, I think, a challenge communicating some of this to other aging advocacy organizations. Um, we are not the only aging advocacy organization on the CVAC, but we're the only one here today for a number of reasons, right? So um, that has been a real source of tension in some ways um, for me to say yes and in a world where there are so few vaccines. Thank you, Denny. Um, I'm going to uh, move us along now to Christina, who is the executive director of the of CFILC, the California Foundation for Independent Living Centers, and, uh, who has been asking a lot of insightful questions today as well. Um, she has, Christina has spent a lot of her time arguing for as broad an array of routes to vaccination for high-risk persons as possible, and has actively worked on, on implementing those routes. She's had a vision for the role that ILCs could play in California in vaccination, and has also been strategizing for how the role of, of how that the vaccine rollout can and should occur for children under 60 years, including children with high risk conditions. Christina. Thanks, Sylvia. And uh, I think I have a, another quarter or so left, but I'm also a proud DREDF board member. So I just want to share that with everyone as well. But thank you for um, the introduction. And um, I'm really excited to be able to be a part of this conversation today. I think it's great just to be able to reflect with each other because that's a lot of what this is. And we haven't had a chance to do that. So it feels really comfortable. Um, yeah, I think, you know, I'm in a very different role somewhat at the California Foundation for Independent Living Centers. Um, CFILC is a statewide association for the independent living centers across the state that choose to be members on an annual basis. And we currently represent 23 out of the 28 centers. And, you know, the voice that I bring to the CVAC and the voice that I bring in, in all the platforms that I'm invited to is to, or that I push myself into, um, is representative of my membership. So my membership is made up of the independent living centers. And for those who are attending today that don't know, that means uh, leaders with disabilities, leaders with all different types of disabilities across the age span. 
And we really had, um, obviously, and for obvious reasons, we had a, um, a real um, interest in being able to do vaccine work, um, COVID-19 work, I'll say, in general, on so many different levels, because not only was it impacting the services that we provide to community members, but because we're required to also have our staff and board be 51% people with disabilities, we were looking out for ourselves too, because it, for me, myself, as somebody with a disability, I mean, this pandemic has put um, a significant challenge on many of us in the workforce with disabilities that have underlying health conditions, and that includes um, the ILCs, which is one of the largest uh, employers of people with disabilities in the state and the country. So we really were looking at it from a, a two-pronged approach as, okay, what are we going to do for our community, the folks that we serve, and how are we going to model as folks with disabilities ourselves that, that this is important and this works or that doesn't work or what we need to do. And, you know, one of the the values um, of independent living is all about choice. And so when, when the CVAC started talking about people with disabilities getting vaccinated at their doctor's office only, I can recall being really frustrated and, and getting angry and thinking, okay, I need to pull back a little bit. I've at least got them to stop talking about us as comorbidities and as people. So let me just take a deep breath for a moment and remind them that people with disabilities want choices too. And if that means going to a mass vaccine site, that means going to a mass vaccine site, but that we also need to make sure that those vaccine, those vaccine sites are held accountable and are accessible and have accommodations. So I think you know the independent living centers, both statewide and uh, in their local counties have been doing a tremendous amount of work. We saw early on um, when the CVAC was being formed at the statewide level, I immediately uh, mobilized my members to get active in their local vaccine committees too. And if they didn't have a, a local vaccine committee or if maybe it was too late, at least being there to have a voice in the public testimony or seeing if there was an equity committee. And so we were very fortunate to, to be ahead of the game. Um, and we did get many of our ILC staff engaged in either the local committees or the equity committees. And as a result of that, um, we helped with the partnerships with the FEMA pilot that came to the state. Um, Aaron did as well, but we made sure that the pop-up sites that FEMA was holding um, were in inclusive of people with disabilities. We held a few of those pop-up sites at independent living centers. We gave FEMA staff um, an opportunity to learn from disabled folks that understand the ins and outs of what it means to get um, access programmatically and physically. Um, and, and now we still have such a long road to go. So I certainly don't wanna make today's call feel like um, we're, we're closer to the end because I actually feel like we've, we've just begun and that the work we have in the world of hesitancy is so real. And the individuals with disabilities across the state that I've individually interviewed and talked to just within this week, they have very significant concerns and reasons why they don't wanna get vaccinated. And I think that um, everybody's opinion is extremely valid. Um, and I think that we have a lot of work to do to ensure people that it's safe and that it's going to benefit all of us. And so I know a lot of people depend on herd immunity and herd immunity will not happen until we're all vaccinated. Guess what? So yes, we want to protect ourselves and we want to protect each other. And that means being vaccinated. And I, I do want to make sure though that the barriers to vaccines are uh, you know, dispelled or are very limited. And that's why we're pushing the state really hard to make sure that there's multiple transportation offers uh, opportunities to get to a clinic. And I think we've been very successful in getting the state not to require that people jump through hoops in order to get a vaccine at their home. Uh, you know, the, the state system, when it's updated, is supposed to allow you to just simply hit a button. Yes, I need a vaccine at home, not to prove it, not to explain yourself, but just that I need a vaccine at home. 
And I think that that probably wouldn't have happened with all of us a part of the CVAC. I also just want to mention that, um, you know, the independent living centers, like some of the others on the call, were able to use their CARES funding from one of the early stimulus packages to ensure that people with disabilities in the community had access to um, a variety of different needs. So rental assistance, um, to medical appointment um, assistance, to technology assistance, CFILC, we we were very fortunate to be able to provide our centers with um, bulk price on thousands of Chromebooks for individuals with disabilities to make sure that they were not isolated, that they had internet access. And, and actually some of our centers used their CARES dollars to ensure that uh, individuals had access to the internet by prepaying their bills for a year in advance so that they would be able to get online with their new device, their new Chromebook that we purchased them. And then um, lots of centers continue to provide backup personal assistance service for those that maybe have a, a personal assistant, a caregiver that can't come to work because they've been impacted by COVID. Um, having those CARES dollars available to make sure you could still bring somebody in to your home when you need help. Um, we've paid early on for people to isolate and stay into stay in motels and other facilities if they needed to isolate away from the rest of their household. And then one of the other pieces that continues to be a need is transportation. Transportation um, resources like bus tickets or Uber credits, Lyft ticket you know, credits um, to both testing sites and to vaccine clinics. So I, I think we, um, you know, there's, there's not um, a day that we don't have enough to do. And we are lucky that we've been doing this work so um, steady for, for over a year now, I can't believe it's over a year, that um, every week when I meet with my membership, we talk about the number of people that need a vaccine at home, the number of people that are hesitant. Um, we sort of have a checklist of tallies that we go over that we've been doing since last April. And, you know, we're looking forward to working with the state to implement the strike, the ambulance strike teams that they're contracting with to be able to push those transportation services out to the community and ensure that folks that have been waiting to get a vaccine get that vaccine now. Thank you, Christina. That, that was a lot. Um, you know, because I would, um, I'd like to give uh, you all an opportunity to ask questions here, Christina, but I also want Andy to have a chance to speak as well. So I'm going to ask you to save your questions and then we'll have more of a, an open question time after Andy is gone. Um, I know we started a few minutes late too. So um, Andy Imperato, uh, our, our last panelist here, but certainly not the least, is the Executive Director of Disability Rights California and is also a member of the Biden-Harris Administration COVID-19 Health Equity Task Force. I, I wanted to ask him what is happening nationally um, and how nationally the situation is compared to the situation in California. Uh, what, is, what is the difference that federal leadership and support um, makes when it comes to vaccination on the ground? And also uh, for Andy and maybe for all of us looking at some of the new issues that are arising for people with disabilities and COVID-19, um, such as vaccine hesitancy, um, vaccination, vaccination of children under 16, or the kind of the vaccination requirements that are coming up in, in let's say adult day programs or other kinds of programs um, for travel and et cetera, and the impact on people with disabilities. So Andy, take it away with that huge list of things I've given for you to talk about. All right, if I don't get to everything, we can come back to them in the Q and A, but before yeah. I talk about the federal, <clears throat> questions. I, I just wanted to mention one important thing that happened that I don't think we've referenced yet, which is both on the healthcare rationing issue that Denny referenced that, that happened back in April of last year and on the vaccine prioritization issue. When, when things got particularly heated, um, Secretary Mark Galley, the California Secretary of Health and Human Services, played what I thought was a really important role in listening personally to the disability community concerns and then engaging in 
um, discussions with the California Department of Public Health to try to broker um, a way forward that would have the support of the disability community and the California Department of Public Health. So I just wanna give him public credit for being, I think the kind of leader that we deserve in the state of California. His job has not been easy during the pandemic. A lot of the times when he was intervening on our behalf, it was after a full day of putting out fires. Um, so I'm just grateful to Secretary Galley for the role that he played. Um, you know, on the question of kind of what kind of federal leadership do we deserve? I think an interesting question for all of us is if you can set aside the Trump White House and some of the unique challenges associated with the, the occupant of the White House, there, there are federal institutions that transcend political you know, uh, regimes or administrations that I'm hoping will take a hard look at how they performed as an institution during this pandemic. And I feel like the, the CDC um, was not well prepared to give the kind of federal leadership that the disability community and other vulnerable populations deserve throughout the pandemic. Um, so one of our challenges, Denny brought up the data challenge that we heard from the Solicitor General, I mean, from the uh, Surgeon General of California and from some of the folks at the California Department of Public Health. But one of the reasons we didn't have better data is because the CDC was not collecting and presenting that data. The CDC you know, had their list of, of conditions that they felt like they had enough data to be able to say with some confidence, these conditions are more likely to produce negative outcomes if people get COVID. But they were very explicit that that list was not intended to be exclusive and it was not intended to be used for vaccine prioritization. And yet multiple states, including California, tried to use it for vaccine prioritization. So to me, that's a failure of federal leadership. If, if you're going to put a list like that out there and you see people using it in a way that it was not intended, what are you doing to fix the problem? And you know, some could argue, well, that wasn't the CDC's role. And then I think we dealt with this issue where the feds were reluctant to tell the states what to do. In some instances, the state was reluctant to tell local public health authorities what to do. But when you think about the multiple levels of government, you have to ask the question, which level of government is best positioned to solve which problem? And certainly on this issue of data, showing who is a high risk person with a disability, the federal government can bring a lot more to that equation than a state government can or a local government can. So I would say that whole issue of data and kind of accounting for the gaps in data and presenting the data in a responsible and compelling way and updating the list in a responsible and compelling way, that was failed leadership on the part of the CDC. And that, that was failed leadership when Trump was in the White House and it continued during the transition. I think the CDC is starting to get better. I will give a shout out to Karen Remley, the head of the National Center on Birth Defects and Developmental Disabilities, who's relatively new in her role. I'm seeing her assert herself in multiple ways, including co-hosting an event with the White House this week on getting the vaccine to people with disabilities. But from my perspective, we didn't get the leadership from the CDC that we deserved. And I would say it's part of a bigger problem in public health that we saw play out at the federal level, at the state level, and at the local level, which is there are not a lot of people with disabilities working in public health. There are not a lot of people with deep disability competence working in public health. So when the public health officials are asked to make life and death decisions about who's gonna get prioritized for the vaccine, they're starting with a deficit in knowledge and information about the disability community. I mean, we experienced this multiple times on the Community Vaccine Advisory Committee where we had to explain to the state, to the people that were making these decisions, why is the in-home supportive services population an inherently high-risk population? Why are the regional center uh, clients an inherently high-risk population 
What are the demographics on these populations? How do we reach them? Are there people in these populations who are not high risk? How do we identify those folks? Like all of these questions came up multiple times from the state and it felt like the state agencies that had the most knowledge about these populations were not being tapped by the Department of Public Health. So we were being asked to provide information that they easily could have gotten from other state agencies. So, um, so I would just say, I'm hoping one of the things that will happen in the wake of the pandemic is that public health officials at all levels of government will say, we have to develop deeper disability competence. If you look at Cal OES uh, emergency services, they have a competent person who is the chief of access and functional needs. We need people like that all over public health. You know, um, Tomas Aragon, who's the head of the California Department of Public Health, deserves to have somebody who reports directly to him, ideally who has lived experience with a disability and deep knowledge of the disability community. The CDC needs to elevate that knowledge and expertise internally to the director level. Um, and then the local public health entities across the state of California and across the country need more disability competence. Certainly partnering with independent living centers and other disability led organizations is a great opportunity. But I, the bottom line, Sylvia, is I don't think we got the leadership we deserve from the federal government throughout this pandemic. And we suffer, people died because we didn't get that leadership in a timely way. Um, if you think about the vaccine hesitancy issue, you know, we've been briefed on the CVAC and I've been briefed in the health equity task force at the federal level on all these campaigns to deal with vaccine hesitancy. You know, California has a, a campaign to deal with vaccine he hesitancy, uh, the Ad Council and, you know, uh, major players at the national level have a campaign. I don't understand why these campaigns were not ready to go and well vetted with all the different communities who were most experiencing the most hesitation long, long before April. You know, I mean, we knew vaccines were coming. We knew there was going to be vaccine hesitancy. So it just feels like so much of the work to try to address these problems started literally as we were deploying vaccines when it could have started much earlier. So again, I mean, I'm hoping there will be, you know, when we have a natural disaster, we do after action reports where we try to learn from our response to a disaster so we're better prepared for the next one. I'm hoping there is an after action report from all of COVID, you know, going back to healthcare rationing, looking at the availability of PPE, you know, just all the things that we dealt with as a country and as a state and think, and then again, this is part of the purpose of the health equity task force. What do we learn? How can we do it better next time? And where do we have to build capacity? And again, I, I'm going to close. I, I know I didn't answer all your questions, but I want to get into more dialogue, but I want to close with the big lesson for me is that public health is not prepared to meet the needs of people with disabilities in this kind of a crisis. And that can't happen again. California has to invest in building deeper capacity in the California Department of Public Health. Local governments need to invest in building deeper capacity in local public health departments. And the feds need to elevate the disability expertise at CDC and other parts of the federal government that have a big impact on public health. Thank you, Andy. That's, uh, I, I could see all of us nodding our heads as you were speaking because we feel these things so similarly. Um, I know we are at the end, we are at 102. Um, and I'm not sure how the, for the ASL interpreters, for our Spanish interpreters, whether whether we, we can continue, let's say, with a question from any of you. I mean, but I'll- Hi, Sylvia, this is Susan. Yes. We actually have more time, till 1.30, we have time. Oh. That's great. I somehow had been confused and thought we had to end at one, but then we're, we're, we're good. We're good for a real discussion here about uh, some of the really critical issues that Andy has raised. Um, Sylvia, if we do have time, can I just go back to something that Aaron said that I mm -hmm. think is an interesting kind of, of course. question for us? So at one point, Aaron said kind of in passing, how do we get vaccines to people who are truly homebound? 
And I guess what I'm kind of struggling with personally is do we really care if somebody is truly homebound? Like I, I feel like anybody who wants a vaccine at home should be able to get the vaccine at home and it might actually help us get the vaccine to people if we can define that population broadly because what we're hearing from the state and from the third party administrator is that they're not able to send out vaccines to people in their homes until they have a critical mass of people. So if it's kind of similar to Denny's, you know, scenario where they could vaccinate the older person, but not the other people in the house. I feel like for the homebound deployment, defining that population more broadly might result in getting vaccines disseminated to people where they live faster. So I just put that out there. I don't, I don't think it's a simple analysis. And Aaron, I know you said that in passing, you may not actually be you know, advocating that we have a narrow definition of homebound, but I think it's an interesting question that we're dealing with in California right now and that the whole country is gonna be dealing with. I think it's important that you picked up on that word because I used it intentionally. So, um, and it's a fair one to, to, to think through. I have not seen the state adopt um, some version of what's truly homebound. And it's interesting that, um, what did you hear around, um, we can't do in-home vaccinations until there's there's a, a, a enough people to vaccinate in homes? What did you hear the there? Critical mass within critical that mass. geographic area. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't hear them define that with precision, Aaron, but I guess the sense that I'm getting is at least with regard to Pfizer and Moderna, in part because uh, the vaccines go bad after a while. They don't want to deploy a set of vaccines to do home uh, vaccinations if it's going to result in a whole bunch of them going bad. Uh, maybe I'm not understanding this, the scenario properly, but I've heard multiple people say to us, it's going to take longer to do the home vaccinations because we can't deploy until we have a certain number of people to do it once, which it doesn't really make sense to me, but I've, I've heard that said in a, multi, in a number of settings. Yeah, I, I don't think that experience and evidence in other state actually bears that out, including the White House's presentation this week on vaccines where they highlighted um, uh, veterans efforts going to truly remote, remote areas and, and that did not look like there's a critical mass um, from what I saw. And so I think I think Calif I, under I understand and appreciate California's desire for efficiency, um, um, but I don't think that should be the, the guideline or the barrier for it. That said, that's independent from your core point, which is, is you know truly homebound the right um, uh, uh, the right guide to to adopt um, for it? And where do you draw? How do you draw the line between you know here's a strict narrow standard versus a you know a, 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 who wants it in home Con you know concierge type service where you know anybody who says yeah I just prefer if you just came to my house um, the, the, there's too many people to vaccinate that the system can't actually accommodate that. So how what's the right way to draw it? But I'm afraid that this is Christina, if we do narrow it, we might be missing people that this is the only way they would do it. And so, you know, I, I am fearful of that given that um, <clears throat> vaccine um, access, vaccines are slowing down. Implementation is slowing down right now. And so I don't want to put anything in the way of folks getting vaccinated. Um, and I don't want to question why somebody needs it at home. I want them to be able to get it if that's where it needs to happen. Uh, yeah, I, I feel similarly to that. This is Sylvia. And thinking about how, um, yes, I think it's very linked to the hesitancy issue um, that now we're reaching people who it's like, if they're sort of thinking through the barriers, maybe, maybe it's possible with a lot of effort to get to you know, they have to ask a neighbor, they have to pull in some, some chits, you know, <laughs> they have to get favors, right? And they can get, they could get there, but they're kind of wondering about getting the vaccine if they have to get it right now anyway. Um, then they're, they, they wouldn't do it. Um, it was interesting in the White House forum, one of the, I think it was Philadelphia, there was this someone, uh, I think a nurse practitioner who said he, when there were leftover vaccines, there was this urgent thing that the clinics would call him and he would rush over there and get those vaccines and go out to a list of people he knew were needed them at home. And I remember sort of thinking, isn't that like feeding leftovers 
to <laughs> to people with disabilities who can't get it's like okay we have to have it we have two that have to be used up so i'll just go down the list now and he was it's talking about like i would go to see people who needed the vaccine at their home at 9 30 at night and <laughs> is that is that the best approach that that you're going to tell someone an older person okay i can get there at 9 30 just be ready and it's just i mean i I, I, I saw the heart behind it and the desire to reach people in their homes. And I also felt that just seems like a pretty narrow approach to, if that's the way you think- And why do we have to be treated that way? Yeah, it just seemed a little odd. But. I mean, why do we have to wait? Why couldn't that be done earlier in the day? That's just right. ridiculous. Yeah, but Sylvia, I, I agree. I mean, that's why I've also, that's why I'm also trying to encourage the state to use our network of centers that have already been tracking the folks that need it at home to show and hopefully learn, engage some best practices from that experience so that they can deploy it quicker. Because I heard the same thing as Andy, and I don't want folks to have to wait till August or September or whenever to get that in-home vaccine. I want to get it as soon as possible to that person. So if using the independent living center list as a model to make that happen, then let's make it happen. Yeah, Sylvia, I agree with you regarding highlighting that example of the of the nurse. You know, it was it was uh, heroic. I googled the person's name, and there's so many newspaper articles about this individual and their work. And I just thought, what evidence of a broken system? Like, I I, I mean, I, I appreciate what the individual is doing, but to, to the extent that the, that that is what the person has to do to get you know uh, a medical supplies during a health uh, a public health crisis um is is evidence of something's wrong but the the reason i argue for a, a narrower version of homebound is that my understanding is that, is that vaccinations the ability to get a vaccine to someone at home is is still scarce there's not uh, there's not an abundance of resources for it so in some ways we're at the needing to to make priorities of, uh, to, to figure out who gets the scarcity. And I, I if, if we open it up broadly, then anybody who is interested, you know, can say, just come to my house. I'd really prefer that. That'd be nice. And it goes back to the early days of the vaccines where, you know, there were efforts to do community inreach, um, say, to Central Valley, a vaccine clinic in Bakersfield, and suddenly it's people from Los Angeles who are showing up. Um, community inreach in Los Angeles. We're going to go to Echo Park and suddenly everybody who shows up at the vaccine clinic in Echo Park does not look like people who live in the neighborhood. Um, so I wanna make sure that however, the the, the scarce resource of, of in-home vaccinations happen, that they're happening to the people um, who are not getting crowded out by, by others. I also think there's some of this that like the people who, um, the people who are coming from outside Echo Park to get vaccinated have largely already gotten vaccinated. So I'm thinking about just the timing here is like, if we were building this out on the front end, I would want to, I, I would want to go more narrow because I would be concerned about the gaming, the gaming issues. The other piece I was thinking about was, you know, I, and I don't know how this cuts, but like, I think that the critical mass issues are linked to the mRNA vaccines and that J and J is a lot easier, but also J and J is more complicated in that the rollout has been <laughs> <laughs> has been botched. So, um, and I, I, and I don't want people, you know, to Christina's point about like people feeling that they have choice. Like, I think that's really important, whether you're getting the, not only just to be, out, be able to have the choice to get it at home, but also to be able to choose, you know, what vaccine you want. I think that's an important piece too. And I, I think it's good that we have J&J &J because it's easier, you know, to facilitate, but it's also when people are, to Sylvia, your point earlier, like if people are already hesitant um, and now it's gonna come with a warning, you know, I, I just, it's not gonna be a perfect solution. But I, but I think that the gaming concerns I am less concerned about because the people who've gamed the system have already done that by now. Sylvia, can I bring up another issue that we haven't really touched on? Yes, of course. The, the role of the media. Like, I don't know, I don't know if everybody remembers, but we had one community vaccine advisory committee meeting where one of us talked about how people were going to die unnecessarily if they went to an age system and didn't find a way to prioritize people under 65 who are high risk and made them wait until June to get the vaccine, which is something that Dr. Pond estimated at one of, at one of our meetings. And the LA Times listened to that 
and after the fact quoted that. And then every day for like two weeks, they had stories about how the vaccines were going to impact people with disabilities. And there were certainly other media outlets, you know, um, public radio, I mean, just a number of different media outlets, so certainly the San Francisco Chronicle, the Sacramento Bee, other outlets. What was interesting to me, Sylvia, was that I would say I probably talked to 30 reporters over a couple months. I would say like a sixth of them at least told me about their own disabilities. Like the reporters who were covering this story, which was a very personal story that affected every reporter, they, they wanted me to know that they had a stake in the game because of their own disability. That, that has not happened to me in 30 years of disability advocacy. I can never remember having so many reporters. So there's something very personal and very ubiquitous about this story. And I don't think we would have had the progress that we did in California without a lot of help from the press. I agree, this is Christina. And I didn't know that happened to you, Andy, but in my experiences with the reporters too, and I can remember because I was doing a garden tour outside when one of them called me and he personally shared with me that he had diabetes and that that's why he was doing this story. So yeah, it, it did happen quite a bit. And, yeah, thank, thankfully they took our stories. I, I also just wanna, um, unless we wanna keep on going on this conversation, um, Susan had brought up in the chat, what about uh, children below the ages of 16 with disabilities? And, you know, we don't have a lot of information on that yet. Um, everybody 16 and up now is currently a on for a small age group beneath the age of 16, below the age of 16. I think it was 12 to 16 year olds are currently being tested and that we would find out um, how the testing results happened or what happened from those testing results at our next meeting. Um, but it sounds like the, the way so far uh, vaccines will roll out for kids is it'll be different age segments until the end. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not sure, you know, as somebody who is a parent of a child with a disability that, um, you know, would definitely have issues if um, he were to get COVID too, possibly. Um, I'm one of those parents that's not sending my child back to school because of his disability. And um, he's very young. So I don't, I don't anticipate that kids within the elementary school age are all going to have the option to get vaccinated before the next school year begins. But I also think that um, it's really important that we've worked so hard on the aging and disability front that we have a lot to offer on the issues of vaccinating children with disabilities and making sure that uh, they are prioritized when, when that option becomes available and that it's accessible and that just like how we fought that, you know, when people with disabilities or care providers get their vaccine, they should get them together. If somebody in the family did not get a vaccine and their kids up for one, we should vaccinate the whole household. Like we need to be there to again have our voices just reiterate what we did through the, the adult and aging process because I don't want that work to be forgotten about and the gains that we made in that process. Right. It, your your remark on that, Christina, makes me think about. You know, for all of us, it, we have two more CVAC meetings, I think, one in May and one in June. And it seems like it's sort of tapering off as a, as a CVAC issue. And yet there are these very specific issues, equity issues, um, that need to continue to be addressed, I, I think, widely. I mean, one of the ways I've really been trying to address vaccine hesitancy, or as, as I've heard it termed before, uh, lack of vaccine readiness, that people just aren't ready for it yet, right? Um, is, is the message that you're getting vaccinated not just for you, but for everyone around you, for your family, um, for, for the, the grandparents you wanna hug, for the, you know, it's, 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 it's a, a, a message of, of community, right? Um, and I do think that that's important to keep in mind that, that that also applies to vaccination generally. I mean, there are lots of kids that are going to be looking at this. And yes, in age groups, I think it's 12 to 15 right now, 
uh, I think the last group they're sort of looking at and testing is maybe those under five or four thinking that they don't need to go to school yet, right? But there's still, it's still, there are babies in trials. Um, and I, it's anticipated that at least one of them, I think maybe Pfizer is going to be applying soon for an extension to its emergency use authorization. So it's, it's going to happen. And then, then it, it's, you know, I, I think it's important that we all remain part of that conversation there at Kids with Developmental Mental Disabilities. And, and if you have that, you know, maybe it seems easiest. We'll just vaccinate everyone when they're at school. But there are some kids who are not at school yet because th their immune systems are, are, they're not going to respond well to uh, um, the shot or they're, they have disabilities, they need herd immunity. And, or they can be at home and get the shot, but they're not at school yet. So those kinds of considerations and the, the need for a parent to be there um, for, uh, or a support person to be present is also going to this. You can't just think, well, we'll get the kids when they go to school, even though that may seem like the easiest solution, um, that, that we just need to be at the table for that conversation as well. You know, Sylvia, one thing that gives me some hope on the kid issue is, in my experience, pediatricians are very effective advocates and they're not afraid to engage in policy mm -hmm. advocacy. Um, so I feel like when it when it becomes ripe to deploy the vaccines, we're going to hear hear from pediatricians who are connected to children's hospitals, developmental pediatricians, and other folks who are going to be able to make a strong case for prioritizing kids with disabilities. They'll use the terminology special healthcare needs or other other terminology that get used in pediatric settings. But I, I really think the pediatricians are going to mobilize and some of the best pediatricians in the country are in California. And I think they're going to be heard from on this issue. So I think that there is really just, there was one question that was raised in the chat that I'm going to sort of toss out there. Um, and that had to do with sort of a, a growing issue too. And the specific question was, do you think adult day programs will require everyone to be vaccinated to attend once they are open again? When do you foresee them opening? And I think that also leads to the broader question of when programs or agencies or employers think about implementing vaccination requirements, how does that affect people with disabilities? And I think part of that question is for us to predict what's gonna happen but I also think it's interesting for us to ask the question, what do we want to happen? Right. And like, I know that what I want to happen is that we think about the whole disability community when we answer the question. There are gonna be people with disabilities who are not gonna be able to get vaccinated because of their disability. And if we create another kind of second class status for them because they've never gotten a vaccine that doesn't feel like a good position for us to take as disability advocates. But there are also going to be people with disabilities who can't go to work or other settings if they can't get some assurance that everybody in that setting has been vaccinated or some other assurances that will protect their, their own health and safety. So this is the kind of thing where I'd want Disability Rights California and some of our lawyers to get on a call with DREDF and for us to debate it like we did on, on face masks because it's not that simple. I, I don't think the answer is that simple in terms of what we want. Christina, I see you nodding. Would you have thoughts? Well, Andy, I, I, I agree with you. Yeah, I'm with you 100%, but I want you to explain, because I, I know we're so deep into it that some people <laughs> might not uh, recognize why you said some people with disabilities won't be able to get it, because it's not about a, a physical get. Explain what you mean by some people with disabilities won't get it or won't be able to get it and how that will cause discrimination. You know, I think there's a lot of ways that that could happen. One, one is literally because of your disability, it's not recommended that you get the vaccine. There are, there are people that have underlying health conditions who are not recommended for the vaccine. Another is because you've made a decision that just like anybody else in California, that you're not, the vaccine is not for you, but it's just going to become another mark against you as a person with a disability that can be used to exclude you from things that you otherwise, you know, would not want to be excluded from. And then there are people who have, you know, autism or other behavioral disabilities where they may 
never get to the point where they would voluntarily get the vaccine? Or are you going to force them to get the vaccine against their will? You know, so I just feel like this could play out in a lot of different ways for folks with disabilities. And we just had, I think it benefits from really kicking around the different scenarios before we say, oh, absolutely, everybody in a certain setting should be required to get the vaccine in order to return to that setting. Danny? I think it's also, if I can just add, I think that it's a question that we're grappling with already in the um, congregate living context. Um, I don't know if folks saw, there was an article, I think it was in the Times earlier this week, um, that was talking about how there was an outbreak, even though 80% of the residents had been vaccinated because a couple of the um, workers at the facility were not vaccinated and brought it in. And actually one person died, um, even though the vast majority of infections were asymptomatic. So I agree, Andy, like it's, it's complicated. <laughs> I'm not sure exactly like we have a perfect answer, but that it's, um, there are a lot of different considerations, even for people who've already been vaccinated, there, there is a risk um, when people who are unvaccinated are, are carrying the, the, the COVID-19 um, infection, so. Yeah, I'd say that um, from, I haven't heard anything at the state level um, the mess about mandatory vaccines. The messaging has all been around, um, let's meet the demand of, uh, I don't know that they've used the word voluntary, but they've just focused on, there's gonna be demand, let's talk about that. I don't know, I don't read that as a policy statement or conclusion around mandatory, non-mandatory. I think it's just a matter of, at least for the state's perspective, they ha that question's not ripe yet. Um, also, I've heard a lot of talk of just about the 80% number, Denny, that you talked about. Um, you know, the, the state's goal is to get 75 to 80% of the population vaccinated. Well, what happens when you break down subpopulations? You know, for them, it's 75 80% of the general population, then that's when you have, that's, you know, the, the critical mass of sorts. Um, but what about the subpopulations of, of congregate settings and um, a, a, a day program um, where people are going to have, a, really be impacted if they get COVID. So what happens there? So the, the, I just want to point out in this question that I've only heard the question from the community. I haven't heard it within state departments, but um, that doesn't mean there won't come a time that they'll need to answer it. Yeah, this is Christina. I'm glad you recognize that and, and share that, Aaron, because I haven't seen um, any of the fake news that I'm hearing about. But as I mentioned earlier, when I had done some of those one-on-one -on -one calls with folks in the community with disabilities, they were pointing to information that they got somewhere and I should have asked where they got that from, but that there would be limitations of them doing X, Y, Z if they weren't able to show their vaccine card. So definitely information is circulating right now. And, and I think we're gonna need to work really hard to make sure that folks know that at this point, that's not any type of factual information. Right, so it's it's a matter of the vaccine becomes mandatory because of access issues or other. Um, you know, I'm I'm a business. I run a restaurant, and I say you can't come in unless you show me your vaccine card. Yeah, something like that. That's interesting. Um, Sylvia, I you know we've got just a few minutes left, and you um, in this setting were the moderator, but um, in all of our community vaccine advisory committees, your meetings and and the private meetings we had, you you were you were there as a member. You're not a moderator. Um, what is it that you want to contribute to this conversation from your point of view and your experience? Um, well, thanks, Aaron, for that question and, and uh, for pinning me <laughs> on the spot here. I think, you know, I've, I've, my, I, my real intention, my desire was to have a, an, a, a conversation, you know, today about, about the work we've done and how we how we continue with some of this work moving forward because i i think there will be challenges i mean you're you're right aaron the in in many ways the sort of the discussions about vaccine passports or state requirements around vaccination aren't aren't ripe yet but part of our job i, I think as advocates is to think about what will be coming down the road and and to have sort of positions or at least thought through the positions um beforehand and I think that this, even if the CVAC meetings don't continue, I think that if we can continue as a group and potentially even pull others in um, to have discussions about, about 
vaccination and what we've learned from it, it will be really important. I, I hear tossed around in state government and in California and federally all the time this phrase lessons learned. But it seems to me that on their own, state and local entities don't necessarily learn lessons <laughs> that well, unless it's brought up to them repeatedly by advocates. Um, and I, I feel strongly that that's the case here, that, there, that emergencies will come around. You know, we're facing an extended, extensive fire season coming up. We're facing lots of different kinds of emergencies. Um, and potential emergencies at least. And I just think um, the more we can be proactive about how the disability community needs to be included at the very beginning, the better. I will say one of the things, one of the ways we were able to get data is because Jordan is fortunate enough, and there's a shout out here to Dr. Steve K, who is a, um, a, a public health expert, a uh, great researcher, et cetera. He's on the dread of board. And when we asked him for information about the risk factors of people who receive home community-based services, people with high-risk conditions, he did that work. Now you can't count on an efficacy organization happening to have a qualified PhD on their board to do that work, right? That's, that can't be the solution to future needs for data and emergency. This, this has got to change. And I know it's always going to be thinking, you know, we're, we've got the federal legislation, we've got infrastructure, we've got all those great plans for recovery. But boy, we better change the status quo or else we will be, the next emergency will come and we will be in the same situation, looking, looking people in the eye and saying like, I know people are dying. How can I prove that to you? So I, yeah, I, think I, will, I know we're closing, but I will say I'm on the data subcommittee for the community, the, the um, health equity task force. And, and part of the reason I wanted to be on the data subcommittee is so that I made sure that we had good recommendations about filling the holes in data. So um, I'm optimistic that good things will come out of our task force and hopefully it'll be listened to by people that can allocate budgets because part of it is money. Getting good disability right. data costs money. Mm -hmm. So this is okay. Susan. I just want to say thank you to all of you, Christina, Sylvia, Andy, Denny, Aaron, um, Brandon, Lisa, Leticia, and Tammy for all of the work this, in this last hour and a half. Um, the video will, caption video will be up on our website by next Tuesday and on social media. And thank you again. Take care. And I don't, I, if I have a pitch, I'd say the CVAC should continue because this is not going to end. Agree. Okay. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, have Susan. Thank you, Dredif. Thank you for hosting. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.